We're now in the parlor, which is the best room of the house, usually a parlor. It's got better stuff. Um, so we've come through the house, and there's always a, a system and a hierarchy of the parts of the house. So uh, when we first come in, there's a Roman Tuscan order that determines some of the, the woodwork. In the middle room, uh, you jump up to a Roman Doric order. And in this room, you jump up to an Ionic order. Uh, all these things meant something to Jefferson. The other thing we can see in this room is it's, uh, if we look on the plan that maybe we can look at, uh, this is an elongated octagon. So the house is an octagon on the outside. It's the first full big octagon house in America that I can document. But inside, because of the middle room, which is a cube, and because of where you put the four chimneys, you get octagon rooms on the inside or half octagon rooms that are divided by the passage or the, the bed alcoves. So this is Jefferson working very hard with this ideal shape. An octagon is hard to work with. Uh, on paper, you see his studies where he's struggling with where do you put the staircase, where do you put the fireplaces, how does each room get a fireplace? And, you know, it's an ingenious solution. Um, eventually, he decides not to put the staircases inside because they just don't fit. He puts them on the outside of the octagon in little stair pavilions. Um, and that's one very strong clue as to the nature of the house. The only stairs that let you go from the upper level to the lower level you have to get to by going through the bed chambers, which tells you that there's no public here. This house is built and designed and used for privacy, for Jefferson and a couple of servants, or later with a couple of grandchildren. And this is all about privacy because the whole point of Poplar Forest was he can't get privacy at Monticello when he retires. So this room is very important because it was also the library. Jefferson had a special library of Poplar Forest of a thousand books uh, in five languages. And it's heavily literature, history, natural history, uh, poetry. It's not the stuff he's needed to do government for the first 40 years of his life. Uh, this is all for retirement pleasure. Uh, there are a couple other things you can see here that are important. This is a model of one of his polygraph machines. The polygraph was not something for lie detection. It's something that writes two letters at the same time. So if you want to talk about how do we know all the uh, information, all the evidence we know from documents, uh, it's because Jefferson was very adamant about keeping copies of his own letters that he'd send to someone else. So this is a little device that he did not invent, but he loved. It has two pens. You write with one pen and the other copies it. And it definitely takes practice, but sometimes you look at his original, his two originals, and they are very similar, almost you can't tell them apart. So this is very important for restoration because it gives us many more documents to rely on. Uh, this is sitting on a reproduction of a revolving top table uh, that Jefferson had at Poplar Forest. And this is probably used for looking at a number of books at the same time. So at Monticello, you'll see his revolving book stand where he can put, I don't know, six or eight books and kind of rotate it and look at them at the same time and compare them. Uh, that might be what this was for. Uh, it was probably made by John Hemings. Uh, this is a Jefferson design winter chair. And winter chairs were ubiquitous. Uh, they were very common. And so when he orders these from Richmond, he orders 36. And that's not uncommon when you see an inventory of somebody's house. 
they'll have dozens and dozens of these things. These were also used outside. You could take it outside, you could take it on the wing, you could take it on the portico. These are just kind of common chairs. But even this, Jefferson designs and specifies how he wants it painted and what it should look like. Uh, so even the most common thing he is fiddling with and making changes to. So again, this, if you look at all the things in the house, this is very autobiographical. Uh, Monticello, for a long time, has been called an autobiography in architecture. Poplar Forest is, is true, and maybe if Monticello is the autobiography, Poplar Forest, you could say, is the secret diary. Uh, but he's still using all of his favorite things. And one of the, the benefits of, of this project that we can now, after 30 years, analyze is, you know, what does this all mean? And, uh, you know, all these little parts, so what? You know, what's their history? Uh, where are they used? Why did they use them? And in a sense, Poplar Forest has been the missing link between Monticello and the University of Virginia, and it, it now ties everything together but only because we've been able to analyze it and uh, read the evidence and uh, put it all together. Um, in a sense, this has been kind of a golden era of Jefferson restoration because Monticello's been restored constantly, but especially in the 1980s and 90s. UVA has been restoring all the buildings on the lawn that Jefferson so carefully designed and specified and supervised, and Poplar Forest is in the middle of that history. And so, without the process of restoration, investigation, and the research that supports it, we wouldn't know all of this new information about Jefferson, the architect, and Jefferson, the builder. Uh, most of the files that are supporting all these very good restorations are not public. They're not published. They're files that go on a shelf. And there are certain people like architectural historians who might know uh, of this evidence, of the research, of the reports, but usually the general public doesn't. And that, you know, is the story of, of public history. Uh, why are we doing all of this? Why do we go to such lengths to do the authentic materials and craftsmanship? We've been making all of these moldings by hand, with hand tools, not machine tools. Why do we go to all that trouble? Well, it's because most people get their history from visiting historic sites. Public history, they found in the poll, is how most people learn American history. It's not in school, it's not in books, it's not in movies, it's by going to historic sites. So when somebody comes here to see this, how do they know whether it's good restoration or not? Well, they really don't, uh, unless they have access to you know, the history of the project. That's not a reason to, to cut corners. Uh, you do it with a sense of authenticity that gives you, I think, a spirit, an uh, essence of all the right things. And in this way, if you can get the context correct, and people come into the context and hear some stories and see the windows and the doors, they get a closer connection to the historical story and to uh, what happened here. And in this case, in particular, this is Jefferson's most private, intimate place. And if he's the mystery man and you can't quite figure out, Upward Forest is where he would really kind of be himself. Uh, and so that's been the challenge, is to figure out what did he build for his own pleasure that he didn't intend anybody else to see. Why would you build a perfect work of architecture and not invite all your friends to see it? That's a great question, and the answer is 
This is all kind of a, a treat for Jefferson late in his life. Uh, because nobody came here, and this was a three-day travel from Monticello, um, this could have been a very simple house because uh, he just wants to get away. But instead, he builds a very sophisticated, very modern uh, villa retreat uh, just because he, he wants to, he needs to. Uh, so those are some of the things that provide the, uh, the rationale and the meaning for doing the best thing we can for uh, an authentic restoration. So now we're going to go look at a couple of uh, bits of physical evidence that uh, can tell us how all of this comes together.